these companies that we talked about that use all this stuff, whether it's electric vehicle companies or cell phone manufacturers, obviously they're aware of this. Yes, no question. They have to be. Have they made any attempts to mitigate this in any way? The truth, Joe, is no, not sufficient efforts. Most of what is done is PR statements, marketing. Um, all these companies will say, we have zero tolerance policies on child labor. We ensure standards of dignity and human rights for every member of our supply chain, down to the mining level. They'll all say this, down to the mining level. Um, and they say it. Uh, and they may throw some money at the odd NGO or uh, coalition or alliance that's meant to be working on these things. Nothing's actually happening on the ground. Uh, and, and that's what my book will demonstrate, you know, as, as I take the reader on the journey from place to place, mind to mind. Um, there's this fiction that exists outside of the Congo of what companies are doing and what the conditions are like. And then there's the reality. Um, underneath the, those layers of obfuscation, there's the reality. There's the truth on the ground. Um, and not one company, not one business alliance, not one uh, entity up the chain is doing remotely enough to ensure that the, the dignity and human rights uh, of the people of the Congo, not to mention the environment, because all the mining companies there are just polluting and clear-cutting forests to build and expand mines. They're not doing nearly enough to respect the people and earth of the Congo um, while we outside enjoy our, you know, renewable, gadget-driven lifestyles. When you first started researching this book and when you first were aware of this issue, what was the difference between your initial perception versus what you found? So... Going in, um, I was expecting to see some child labor, um, uh, poor working conditions, um, uh, and, and probably some poor environmental uh, practices. And that first trip hit me like a thunderclap. And I've seen a lot, okay? I mean, I've done research in more than 50 countries in the grit and the grime and the misery and the sub the underbelly of humanity. And it hit me like a thunderclap because the scale was beyond anything I would have imagined. There are hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands of children, caked in toxic grime and filth, digging this uh, vital mineral out of the ground in medieval conditions. It's like going back in time. You know, you imagine what mining was like three or four hundred years ago uh, or the early days of coal mining. You know, it's that bad uh, and worse because we're supposed to be living in this enlightened era. Uh, so the scale of it shocked me. The severity shocked me. Um, to see kids up to their shoulders caked in this filth and grime and toxic. I mean, to see teenagers walking around with babies on their back, all inhaling this toxic um, cobalt dust, um, to see them barely scraping by on a dollar a day, two dollars a day. And then as I, as I interviewed these workers, um, I use the term worker, they're not workers at all. They're oppressed, degraded slaves. Um, as I interviewed them, the, the level of injury uh, broken legs, shattered spines, um, toxic contamination, um, cancers, birth defects, uh, uh, the, what's happening to the people there. And then the, the, the most heart-wrenching thing of all, there's probably um, 10 to 15,000 tunnels. I think I even sent you guys one or two videos of, of what these tunnels look like. Um, the artisanal miners will dig tunnels. 30, 40 meters down uh, to get to some of the higher grade deposits. Um, and they don't have supports, rock bolts, ventilation shafts, anything like that. And those tunnels collapse. 
Every week in the Congo, a tunnel collapses. And everyone who's down there, 30, 40, 50 men and boys, boys meaning kids, are buried alive. And when I started hearing those stories, and I heard them on my first trip, I, it just ripped me apart because I thought, this is the bottom of trillion-dollar supply chains? When I plug in my smartphone, I don't have an electric car, but if I did, when I plug that in, I'm plugging in that level of suffering and death. I mean, I can't imagine a more horrid way of dying than being buried alive. And they're down there trying to get that dollar or two because that's the difference between eating and surviving and not. Uh, and that, that's what I wasn't anticipating, just the level of severity. And if, you're, if your listeners are familiar with you know, what it was like in colonial Africa and in the Congo during the Belgian times, I mean, I thought I was back in, in King Leopold's regime where there's just utter disregard for the humanity of, of the people in the Congo, all that matters is the loot. All that matters is the loot, the resource. Get it out, make money, and to hell with the population, to hell with the people there. Uh, they're either a, uh efficient slave labor force or they're just in the way. Uh, but there's loot in the dirt. And we need that loot. Uh, and that's, that's the dynamic down there. This must have been so difficult for you to, to grasp and to report on and just to – what was it like for you to just experience this? Uh, Joe, it's – you know, I haven't – actually, this is the first time I'm talking about it, like, in any sort of extended way. I mean, I wrote my book. Um, much of the pandemic was me just – was me writing, uh, and and that was hard, you know, because there's a lot I had to relive. Um, uh, I take the reader on a journey. Um, uh, you know, in college, we all read Heart of Darkness, Conrad, and that's the first Belgian horror, a Congo horror, uh, you know, was the for rubber. 